reading 38 from the Psychological Commentaries on the Teaching of Gurdjieff and Alspinsky by Maurice Nicole, Volume 2. Birdlip, September 23, 1944. A further note on personal work. On seeing second force in oneself. We spoke recently of how long it takes to see that difficulties can be taken in a work way and how we can be what I called tempted without seeing it simply because we take difficulties as if they should not exist. Now difficulty, that is the force of resistance, is everywhere present and runs through the whole texture of life and also is present in ourselves. Mr. Ospensky once said, In trying to study second force, it is best to begin to try to observe it in oneself. Everyone has inner difficulties, but does not recognize them as being due to second force, and takes them merely as handicaps, from which they feel perhaps that they suffer unfairly. People say, If only this, etc., the idea of second force is expressed in one of the laws of motion in Newtonian physics, where it is said that to every force there is an equal and opposite force. The laws that this work formulates as being fundamental, the law of three and the law of octaves, exist both in nature and in ourselves. It is the law of three that concerns us now, which does not say that to every force there is an equal and opposite force, but that in every manifestation three forces are at work. Active force, or the initiating force, passive force, or the force of resistance, and neutralizing force, which connects the two otherwise antagonistic opposite forces so that something happens. A manifestation takes place. But for the third force, the other two forces, being equal and opposite, would produce a stationary state of affairs by being interlocked like the horns of two equally powerful stags. It is the third force that by making a fulcrum makes things possible that brings opposing things into harmony, that makes use of the otherwise irreconcilable opposites. The work teaches that if we begin to see second force in ourselves, we may catch a glimpse of third force, but that first we must see first force. We spoke recently about will being defined in the work as finding a solution and not as the negation of something. When you see some form of second force operating in your life, something that prevents you from attaining some object, which can be regarded as first or active force, something that keeps standing in your way, the situation demands a solution and not a denying merely. And it is here that an act of will begins in the reconciling of the situation. You cannot do away with second force by violence because it will only become stronger. But you may be able to be a peacemaker and in some way make it cooperate with active force through some new attitude to the situation as third force. One of the most marvelous experiences is to realize how much useless second force we create in ourselves, owing to our attitudes and imagination, and how endless forms of second force arise simply because we do not realize that we possess a number of attitudes and forms of expectancy which we do not observe and which act in such a way as to complicate every single thing in our lives by creating unnecessary and blind second force. 
to separate oneself a little from some of one's attitudes, from some ingrained prejudices, and finally even from the power of some buffers, if this is possible, is to experience a degree of freedom that is very difficult to describe. One realizes that one has been in the power of something that one has never suspected, and notices that one no longer has the same kind of artificial difficulties as formerly. Such an experience makes it possible for one to see one's life in the past more consciously because when there is a shift of the psychological state through an increase of consciousness, that is, say, of awareness of what one is like, one can see one's life in the past more distinctly from this freed and so more conscious point. One cannot see one's life, which is what has been made by one's level of being, from the same level of being. We are quite unable, for example, to see how extraordinarily foolish we have been in a thousand and one things, or how unnecessarily complicated we have made some things, unless a new point of consciousness is born in us from which to see it. You will not be able to see because you have nothing to see with, that is, no new standpoint. But if something has changed in you, and you have thus so far been freed, say, from some attitude towards yourself, or towards others, or towards life, then you will be able to see how this attitude has worked in you throughout your life, and you will know one meaning of the sentence, your level of being attracts your life. It is an interesting experience. Now, to get back to what we were speaking of, that change of attitude or the freeing of oneself from some attitude will change the nature of second force in one's life. Full will is defined technically in the work as being connected with a power of being conscious in all three forces together. On one occasion it was said, we are not even conscious in one force, still less in two and never in three. This is partly to do with the fact that we can usually think of only one thing at a time. We find it very difficult to think in terms of two things and impossible to think in terms of three things. But this is not quite the same as full will because being conscious in a force is not the same as thinking about it. Just as being conscious of the truth of something is not the same as having a conviction about it or being conscious in the state of self-remembering is not the same as thinking about self-remembering. To be conscious in first force is to know what one wants. To be conscious in second force is to know what difficulties stand in the way. And to be conscious in third force at the same time is to be conscious of how what one wants and what opposes it can eventually reach some solution. Each force modifies the other, and indeed, so much so that in the final solution, the result is never like what you set out to attain. It is never like the active force with which you started. Nor, on the other hand, are the difficulties the same as you first were able to see them before the necessary third force or neutralizing force entered into the conscious sphere of experience and adjusted the relations of the first and second forces so as to make some manifestation possible. Now I know all this may sound theoretical, but it is not theoretical. It is quite practical and can be experienced up to a point even now if one knows what to look for and if one has the patience to do it. We must, first of all, be conscious as far as we can in what corresponds 
to first force. That is, taking the forces as they act within us, psychologically, one must be conscious in what one wants, what one wishes, or what one expects. By making this force conscious, instead of thinking about it, which one can often do by a process of inner dialogue, as well as self-observation over a considerable period, one becomes aware of the second force that is inevitably called up by the particular quality of the first force that one has, what one wants. Each active force calls up its own second force. If you are in a hurry, everyone will seem to you to be moving very slowly. If you want to move slowly, everyone else will seem to you to be in a hurry. When you live for a time in the consciousness of what you want, you will at the same time see more and more the second force that it gives rise to. So the more will you become conscious in two forces simultaneously. You will see that you cannot do this or that because of that or this. Yes, but you will see why. By not identifying with either, and this we practically always do, which spoils the whole experience, you may catch a glimpse of the third force entering by magic that makes the first and second force come into a possible relationship so that they are no longer felt as opposing forces, as a conflict of opposites. This is finding a solution, and you will notice that it has to do with will. Will having three aspects in itself, or three forces, and conscious will being therefore consciousness in all three forces, which leads to an act of full will. While this is beyond us at present, it is possible on a small scale. However, we take a one-sided view of will and conceive it always as something that cuts away, that divides, that prohibits, that is harsh, intolerant, unyielding and negating and sticking to one unvarying course. You must see that will, from the work point of view, refers to something responding, something flexible and intelligent, that it is not one-sided but three-sided. Will is, of course, from master or real I in us, and this we cannot expect to know directly. But as long as we are one-sided in every sense, nothing can come from this upper level, from which the influences of real I come that give us our real meaning and inner peace. We must at least learn to have double thinking, first of all, to see things from different sides and to externally consider, not only to see the difficulties of other people by putting ourselves in their place, which is a definite conscious act, but to see the difficulties in ourselves without identifying and, as objectively as possible, because in this way we get a new feeling of ourselves and a new and more flexible sense of what we are, which has a very strange effect on us and is due to an increase of consciousness or light and is really the beginning of the action of the work upon us. We so often feel we are up against things. People often live in this state all their lives. It is then necessary, as by inner dialogue with oneself, such as, what is it I am up against, etc., to find out what it is you are up against, because what you feel you are up against is due to what you want. Then perhaps you are full of impossible and vague wishes that create useless second force and so produce in you the equally vague feelings of resistance, of being up against things. Then you have to begin to become more conscious in first force, in what you want. This sharpens the mind and makes you practical. But do not think it is easy. At the same time, it is not right or good to live always in a vague sense of being lost, of disappointment, of looking back. 
This eats your force. Where are you? What do you want? What is the matter with you? Such harsh questioning of oneself becomes increasingly necessary in the work 